Now I'm going to be the first president to use PowerPoint in the State of the Union. How do you feel about that? Yeah, break out the PowerPoint chant. No, don't do it. presidential campaign in history! We did it, Seattle! We weren't quite there until that moment, but then you just did it. Yes, thank you, Chuck. Thank you all. It's so great to be here. Wow, what's my theme music for today? I don't think we talked about it. Well, uh, it's great to be here. And, uh, visiting Silicon Valley is always a treat. My parents met at UC Berkeley. Any, uh, any Berkeley Bears here in the house? Yes. So it's like I, I owe my existence to that school. My, uh, my brother's named after the Lawrence Observatory. I used to joke that maybe my parents did something fun there, but I'm sure they didn't. They were pretty boring Taiwanese uh, grad students. I'm running for president. Uh, I'm Andrew Yang, and I'm running for president because of, of this topic, uh, which is the impact of technology on the US workforce. And we're here to talk about AI. We're in the hub of Silicon Valley. How many of you all are entrepreneurs or work in technology? The vast majority of you, I'd imagine. Yes. Uh, so I started an organization called Venture for America that was designed to help create thousands of jobs around the country. And so that's what I did between 2011 and 2017. Um, and I was honored by the Obama White House for my work with Venture for America. How many of you all like documentaries, like films? How many of you have Netflix? So there's a documentary about my organization that's now on Netflix with an Oscar-winning director called Generation Startup. Between 2011 and 2017, uh, I helped train hundreds of young entrepreneurs to create jobs in Detroit, Cleveland, Baltimore, St. Louis, Birmingham, New Orleans, and other cities around the country. And I did this in part because Silicon Valley and my hometown of New York City have been a little bit too good at attracting talent. You know what I mean? Like, uh, if you work here in Silicon Valley, you work all the time with people who've come here from other parts of the country and from around the world. Um, but, but what happens is that what benefits Silicon Valley in many ways is depleting other communities around the country. Because if you're a really smart, enterprising grad student in Michigan or Ohio, uh, you're trying to come here. Uh, and then if you're in Michigan or Ohio, then you're looking around wondering what happened to the jobs. So this is what I was working on for the last seven years. And it led me uh, to this hard truth about automation. And so these are just some um, visuals about some of the things that we experience in our society every day now. Uh, but they correspond, unfortunately, to the most common jobs in the American economy. So this, you all see it when you go to the airports. Um, how many of you resent this the same way I do when you go to a supermarket and you have to check yourself out? You have, like, raise your hand if you don't like this. Um, because I'm really bad at it myself. It always takes me an extra five to 10 seconds per item where I'm like, oh, where is the barcode? And I feel very slow and sluggish and I'm like, if only there was a human here to help me. Uh, this little girl's probably better at it than I am. But we all know why they're doing this, that it's much cheaper to have us do it than to have uh, a human clerk do it. Now, this may not be as familiar to you all. This is a, a robot pizza. Uh, and here in Silicon Valley, some of my friends who are venture capitalists are investing in robot pizza trucks, where if you order a pizza, it will get picked up automatically by essentially a pizza oven on wheels that will then come to you. And then uh, you will punch in your code, and then it'll just open the window and say, here's your pizza. So there'll never be a human that picks up the phone. There's never a human that interacts with your pizza. There's not a human that drives it to you. It just shows up on your doorstep. And apparently, it's delicious. I haven't had one yet, but I really want one. Just so I can then say more authoritatively, it's delicious. Oh, this is one that's getting a lot of press for good reason, uh, because driving a truck is the most common job in 29 states in this country. Driving a truck is the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truck drivers in the United States, 94% men, average age 49, average education high school. A lot of them are ex-military. 
they make on average $46,000 a year. So you have to ask yourself, if we are successful here in Silicon Valley at automating away truck driving, what are those three and a half million middle-aged American men going to do? How many of you know people who are working on self-driving cars and trucks? I do too. And we all know why they're doing it, uh, because that's where the money is. $168 billion in financial incentives to automate away truck driving. That's, I mean, that's the sort of uh, nation scale money that can transform our infrastructure in the days to come. Uh, and then, of course, there's the manufacturing jobs. Now, these five slides I just presented correspond to the most common jobs in the American economy. Administrative and clerical is number one. Retail is number two. Food service and food preparation is number three. Truck driving and transportation is number four. And manufacturing is still number five. Now, I have no, I, like, no illusions about you know, any... Um, political alignment. I'm running for president as a Democrat. But uh, to me, the reason why Donald Trump is our president today is because of automation. Uh, and it comes down to what happened here with the manufacturing workers. So manufacturing jobs declined from 17 million to about 12 million over the last number of years. And where were those jobs centered? They were centered in Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Iowa. Now, if those states sound familiar to you, those states are all the swing states in the middle of the country that Donald Trump needed to win to become president. And he did win all of those states. And then if you dig into the voter district data, there's actually a straight line up between the adoption of industrial robots in a voting area and the movement to Donald Trump. For all of the media discussion around Russia and the FBI, and Facebook, and these other factors, the reason Donald Trump's our president is because we automated away four million manufacturing jobs. And looking around this room, I have a feeling you'd agree with this statement. It is not immigrants that are causing the economic dislocation around the United States. It is technology. So our country is now facing these historic changes, and it is confused. It is deeply confused as to what to do. We have a very, very uh, clear message that's saying immigrants are to blame, even though that's not what the facts say. And Americans are so desperate for any kind of narrative that they'll actually turn to that and say, okay, he's saying that and it must be true. And it makes me feel a certain way. And it is now up to us, the leaders of Silicon Valley, to say, no, this is not the truth. The truth is that our economy is evolving in ways that is pushing more and more Americans to the side. It is resulting in economic distress and political and social uh, disintegration. And that we, the people who are building the future, know that this future must include Americans from every part of the country and every walk of life, not just engineers. So we got rid of these four million, well, we got rid of five million manufacturing jobs. The four million were due to automation. One million were due to globalization and, and some other factors. So then what happens? How many of you all studied economics in college? I did, some of you did. So according to our economics textbook, what happens if you get rid of four million manufacturing jobs uh, to those workers? What do those workers do? They get retrained, reskilled, move for new opportunities, find a new job. That is what my macroeconomics textbook said as well. That's what all of our textbooks said. All right, so what actually happened? When in real life, because if you go back, so when did this, when did this uh, decimation happen? It happened starting in the year 2000, right? 2000 to 2016 or so is when this slide goes. So just remember the year 2000. What else happens in the year 2000? Well, let's see, the American labor force participation rate goes off a cliff. You can see that millions of Americans did not find new jobs, they just left the workforce. This is an exodus of unskilled men. Right now, as we're here together, the labor force participation rate in the United States is 63%, which is the same levels as Ecuador and Costa Rica. And that is in year 10 of an expansion. Now, there are very, very rosy some of you are thinking, how can this be? Because I see all the headlines that unemployment is at a near record low, right? It's like 3.8%, something along, along those lines. So how can it be that 
Millions have dropped out of the workforce and our headline unemployment rate is so low. And it's all in the design of the headline unemployment rate statistic that if you leave the workforce like these millions of Americans did, you no longer count in the unemployment rate. That's just the way that the, the statistic is calculated. So it can both be true that you have a, head, a low headline unemployment rate and you have almost one out of five prime working age American men who have not worked in a year. And both of those things are now true. Then what happens? How do these people survive if they leave the workforce? What they do is they file for disability, which is the black line. So disability around 2000 starts to go up and up and up to the point where now there are more Americans on disability than work in the construction industry. 20% of working age adults in some parts of the country are on disability. And then they start to kill themselves in record numbers. Uh, you see here in 2000, this is the blue line, that's the suicide rate among middle-aged non-Hispanic whites in the US, and then it starts to skyrocket. Um, as you can see, in most of these other developed countries, the suicide rate is declining because that's what you'd expect in a developed country. But the United States, it instead goes off the chart to the point where now America's overall life expectancy has declined for the last three years due to the fact that suicides and drug overdoses have each overtaken vehicle deaths as causes of death for the first time in this nation's history. You don't know, want to know the last time American life expectancy declined for three years in a row? The Spanish flu of 1918. We're back in Spanish flu territory because of the fact that we decimated these manufacturing jobs and then the people who were in those jobs saw no future and started to uh, do drugs and uh, drink themselves to death. Now, none of this was in my economics textbook. It did not say, hey, if you get rid of four million manufacturing jobs, they go home, kill themselves, vote for Donald Trump, uh, and start, um, you know, like, like that's not what my textbook said. Um, but this is what is happening. And so if you look around other parts of the country and you're confused what's happening, these are what the facts are. Again, 2000, you see another surge. This is the rate of uh, children in America born to unmarried mothers, which was a shock to me. I had to triple check this statistic. Because when I was growing up, this was about 15%. Now it's 40%. 40% of American children are born to unmarried mothers. Now, you have, now, there are a number of reasons for this, but studies have shown that there's one very big reason, which is that if you're a non-college educated man in this country, you do not have a secure economic uh, path forward, and so you don't think that anyone wants to marry you, and you're right. <laughs> and if you're a non-college educated man in the United States, you have a less than 50% chance of ever being married. But occasionally, you have a kid. And thus you have this table, this, this graph. Now I'm a parent, how many of you all are parents? Uh, now it, it was a shock to me how hard being a parent was and I'm married and there are two of us and we have resources. Um, like I always thought my family was amazing until I had kids. And then I was like, where the hell are my, <laughs> where the hell are my parents? You know, like, aren't people supposed to be like loving on my like kids and like grandkids and whatnot? Like my, my wife and I are like, whoa, there's almost overwhelming. So imagine going through that as a single mom. And imagine that happening in tens of millions of households around the United States. And then play out what happens to those kids as time goes on. Now the data around what happens to American children who grow up in it, because when I say single moms, when you say single parent, 90% of it's single mom. So single parent and single mom are almost synonymous. So if you have millions of American children growing up to single parent households, the data shows that there's a real divergence in outcome based upon if it's a boy or a girl. If you have a little girl, she has a single mom, her single mom's like a superhero, like a superwoman, and then that kid sees, okay, my mom's superhuman, I should try and be like her, and the outcomes are generally okay. If you have a little boy growing up to a single mom, it turns out that little boys are more sensitive to parental time input than little girls. And they don't have a male role model, so they start thinking that boys are losers. They're boys, so they're losers. Uh, they do badly at school, they have behavioral problems, uh, and dysfunction is at much, much higher levels. So this is what's happening in American households around the country. The little boys who grow up in single parent households are particularly 
uh, prone to very negative social and educational outcomes. And if you extrapolate again, this is going to be with us for a very long time because you're talking about 40% of American children at this point, 40% of American boys. So uh, it even extends to our collective mental health. Uh, anxiety, depression, stress levels are all at record highs in this country. It's particularly bad for uh, teenage girls. Uh, and so th those, some of you who are parents of teenage girls, you might be seeing this. And this is tied into technology, where the rise in depression and anxiety is hand in hand with the rise of smartphone use and social media apps. Where one of my friends in Silicon Valley said that you have some of the smartest people in our country working on turning supercomputers into dopamine delivery systems and slot machines for teenage girls. And they get paid a lot of money to do so, and there's really no financial incentive in terms of protecting like, our, our children from uh, things that benefit companies. So this is all a backdrop to why Donald Trump's our president today, and this is why I care. Uh, so there's pictures of my two boys, six and three. My older son is autistic. And so we have to make big choices right now as a country. We have to explain to our fellow citizens that it is not immigrants, it is technology, and then we have to start evolving and advancing in terms of the way we see our economy and our role within it. Because this is not just truckers and retail clerks, this is also going to be radiologists and accountants and lawyers. 44% of American jobs are subject to automation. This is not an us or them problem, this is an everyone problem. And if you look at the, my two little boys, um, you can see they're not very tough. <laughs> they're not very rugged. They're going to do very, very poorly in a country that is tearing itself apart with truckers rioting and people turning on each other. This is the mindset of scarcity that is sweeping our country. 78% living paycheck to paycheck, 57% can't afford an unexpected $500 bill. And so you have to ask ourselves, what is the plan moving forward? Who is making this case the American people? And it turns out uh, I'm making this case the American people. So, I'm running for president now. Many of you might not have heard that much about me in the campaign, but I'm polling at 3% nationwide. <laughs> and I am one of only eight candidates in a field of 21 that has already qualified for the Democratic primary debates in June and July based upon both my polling and the fact that I have over 100,000 individual donors from around the country, including many of you, so thank you for that. So this campaign is taking off, raised millions of dollars in increments of only $20 each uh, around the country, and most people have never heard of me, still. There is a, a political analyst named Nate Silver, uh, who runs a blog called 538. Raise your hand if you've heard of Nate Silver and 538. So Nate Silver took a look at the numbers. You all like numbers, I like numbers. He said, okay, here are the three numbers. Andrew Yang has raised over $3 million in increments of $20 each. Andrew Yang is polling at 3% nationwide, higher than many sitting senators and governors. And Andrew Yang's name recognition is lower than every other candidate's. So he said, based upon those three numbers, our projections uh, cannot discount the possibility that as more Americans fight out about Andrew Yang, he grows and grows and grows and wins the whole thing. And that is Nate Silver. That's Nate Silver, that's not me. So this is the plan to help keep our country strong and whole. This is the plan to help wake people up to the fact that we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, the greatest economic and technological transformation in our nation's history. And we need to start solving the problems that are making Americans miserable so that my kids and your kids can grow up in the same country that most of us grew up in. Well, you came to this country. My parents came to this country to create a better life for, um, for our family. And it worked. And I'm very, very lucky to have been born here in the U.S. and to be an American. I'm very proud to be an American. And my kids, you know, are obviously going to grow up in this country too. And I look out and I see, like, what does the future hold for them? Does their future look as bright as uh, my parents believed it to be? And the, the fact is, it does not. Uh, by the numbers, it does not. So we have to come together and step up and contribute to the country that has given so much to us. Uh, because there are two paths ahead for us. This is the path of scarcity, where people start competing against each other and start losing 
their rationality. And right now, if you have uh, financial scarcity, which is happening right now in this country, it has a functional impact of decreasing your IQ by 13 points or one standard deviation. So anyone who thinks that America is getting less reasonable and rational and more prone to bad ideas, you are right. We are. Because if people can't pay their bills, that's exactly what goes on in their minds and in their households. So this is the future we're aiming for, a future actually that kind of resembles Silicon Valley, if you look, look, look very closely. Um, but this is a future of abundance and shared humanity and of us valuing ourselves, not as economic inputs into a machine, but as human beings and citizens and shareholders of this great country. So thank you all very much for this opportunity. Thank you all very much. You want to help with the campaign? The website is yang2020.com. I'm very proud to be the first Asian American to ever be on the Democratic primary state, uh, primary debate stage in June and July, and you haven't seen anything yet. Thank you all very much.